Let's start our study this evening with a word of prayer. Father, we do come before your presence this evening, and I pray specifically, Lord, that you would show us your way this evening, that you would show us what you specifically want us to know about this passage, Lord, that our minds and hearts would be focused solely on you this evening. Lord, I ask for your blessing on the study, but I also ask that you would be blessed by the study. May your words come clearly. Show us what you want us to know. It's through your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So welcome again. Tonight we're going to be continuing our study as we work our way verse by verse through 2 Corinthians chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles with you this evening, I hope you do, please turn with me to chapter 6. And in a moment, we're going to be picking up where we left off last week. Now, if you have been with us for a little while, We've been working our way through Paul's second recorded letter to the church at Corinth, a church that was largely marked by their immaturity and their need for growth in the Lord. We're going to see that clearly referenced again this evening. So as I've started with previously, a couple of things that I want to continue to remind us of that are very helpful for us as we work our way through the book of 2 Corinthians. Corinthians. So the first thing was, specifically, well, we saw this in the first chapter, the first verse, as a matter of fact. This was a letter that was written specifically to saints. It references that, as we looked at, but not only to them, but to all believers. Anyone that is a believer, this information is important for and these specific believers at that time, if you remember back to what we looked at in that presentation, where they were going through some difficult times, much like what we're going through today. Different, but in the same way. Now, the second thing we've seen so far in our study that is helpful to emphasize is we've seen Paul's emphasis on the importance of the gospel. Now, it's not quite as obvious as it has been in our Roman study, but we have seen that referenced, and we're going to see that come up again tonight as well. A little less obvious, of course, as I said, but again, Paul's strong emphasis on the gospel. Now, additionally, or thirdly, we've seen in Paul's letter and his ministry specifically, well, it continues to be built on the promises of God. Now again, tonight we're going to see that, and that's how he actually finishes up the chapter this evening, regarding the promises. So we've talked about that quite a bit, but I want you to be looking for these promises, and we'll point them out tonight as we get um, into that a little bit further. Lastly, last week specifically, we noticed a lot of therefores in the study. If you remember back to our study, four separate times... We see Paul saying a statement or something to the effect of, therefore, and then he lays out a block of instruction. Paul's laying the groundwork here and really concluded last week's portion of the study, specifically with an explanation of the believer's positional standing in Christ. So we've seen that emphasis on the therefore. We're in a very specific block of instruction that Paul is giving to the church in Corinth. So if you have your Bibles, hopefully you're at chapter 6. We'll jump in here in verse 1 of 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul writes this. He says, We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. So tonight we start our study with a phrase, we then. So that then is much like the statement, therefore, it's built on the things he previously said. So we really need to go back and re-familiarize ourselves with what he previously told us in order to understand the context going forward tonight. So let's turn back to chapter 5. Now, if you were here last week, we went through this last week, so we're going to go through this rather quickly but I want us to be re-familiarized so we understand where Paul's going tonight. So, we'll pick it up here in verse 12, where we were last week, chapter 5. 
He says this, For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf, that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. For if we are besides ourselves, it is for God. And if we are of sound mind, it is for you. Now look what he says next. For the love of Christ compels us. That was Paul's driving motivation. Because we judge thus. Now he's getting into that block of instruction. and He's going to be laying out what our position in Christ is. He says, For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. That one in context, he's speaking of Jesus. Maybe it's capitalized in your Bible. He continues in verse 15. He says, And he, again speaking of Jesus, died for all that those who live should no longer should live no longer for themselves but for him who died for them and rose again i want you to remember that and seize on to that for a little bit later that aspect of no longer living for themselves cuz paul's going to explain that further tonight he says but for him who died for them and rose again verse 16 Therefore, from now on, regard, we regard no one according to the flesh. I had a conversation with the brothers on Thursday about this specific verse. This verse really stood out to me specifically because it really challenged me. How do I regard people? Do I regard people by what I can see of them or maybe, you know, the flesh, the physical appearance of them? Or do I regard them from the way Christ looks at them? by their standing, whether they're in him or not. Just an interesting point there. We regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. I mean, Christ is risen. He's seated at the right hand of God. Verse 17, we get another, therefore, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We talked about that specifically last week. All things in Christ have become new. Now verse 18, he says, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. We talked about that specifically. But that's one of our ministries, is the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, that's how our study started out this evening, we then, he says, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore, strongly urge you, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That was a major takeaway and application point from last week. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That is a wonderful truth, believer. That's how this works, is because he became sin on our behalf, who knew no sin. Now, so back to our verse 1 here that we looked at in chapter 6. He says, we then. So now that we went back and looked at all that stuff previously, well, what is the context here? We then, speaking as new creations, as those reconciled to God, as ambassadors, he said, those with the knowledge of what Christ only could have accomplished, as we just read, now, what do we do with that? That's, we then, that's what he's referring to. He says, as workers together with him. Well, notice that. That workers, that's plural. So that's more than one, not talking about just Paul there, but talking about us as well. And talking about those that were ministering with Paul. He refers to them as workers together with him. Maybe your Bible capitalizes the him there. That's referencing Jesus. We are workers together with him. 
ministers with Christ. That is true of them and true of us. Now look what he says as a result of that. Because of that, because of who we are, and because of the things we read in chapter 5, he says, we plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. That idea of pleading with you, Paul is challenging them not to receive the grace of God in vain. Or in other words, don't take for granted the grace. Got to have an understanding of grace. You guys should know this by now. We've covered this quite a bit. Grace is God's unmerited, immeasurable gift to us in which we neither could deserve or we neither deserve nor could earn given to us because of who he is. In other words, it's all about God. That's what grace is. So what he's saying here is don't take for granted the grace of God lightly. It's a powerful thing. That's what this ministry is built on, as Paul is saying here. Now the question to ask is, well, why, Paul? Well, look at where Paul goes next. He quotes and applies I'm going to use the word, the gospel, from the Old Testament. And this is why the gospel is, the, is every word of God, as we've talked about. It's not simply just the words that we see that a lot of people try to package the gospel in from um, what we talked about last week. No, it's every word of God. It's all important. For us. So look where he goes next in verse 2. He says, For he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. We'll hold up there for a minute. So in verse 2 here, we said, For he, we need to know who that he is. In context here, the he he's referring to is God. We'll see that here in a minute. Well, here we get another promise. So I'm calling this. Promise number one for this evening specifically. And it's helpful to know whom and what he is referring to here when he says, in an acceptable time, I. Now, who's the I that he's referring to? I have heard you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. So Paul is quoting here from Isaiah chapter 49, verses 1, well, it's contained within verses 1 through 12. So turn way over to the left, about the center of your Bible, roughly, to Isaiah chapter 49. So this particular chapter of Isaiah is one of the four servant songs that are referred to in the Bible. What does that mean? Well, these are messianic um, foreshadowings or prophecies of the coming Messiah that are laid out. Um, the common one that you guys know that we looked at, I think it was last week as a matter of fact, or even Sunday maybe, was from Isaiah 52 or Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. If you read through that, you pick up on that right away. Very familiar. But specifically, Isaiah 49, at least the first part of this, is also what is referred to as one of the servant songs foreshadowing the coming servant of Yahweh. We would say Jesus. Let's look at this specifically. Let's pick it up here in verse 1 of chapter 49 of Isaiah. He says, Listen, O coastlands, to me and take heed. So this idea of coastlands, well, it's a reference to the distant lands of the Gentiles. Look what he tells them. He says, you peoples from afar. I mean, it kind of explains that too there. He says, listen and take heed. So in other words, take note of this. What I'm going to say is important, is what the Lord is saying to us. So specifically to the coastlands or the people from afar, we would refer to them as Gentiles here in context. He says, the Lord has called me from the womb. Again, if your Bible capitalizes it, that me is going to be capitalized here. Well, speaking, it can't be the Lord that he's talking about here. He's talking about somebody else. Well, we would refer to this me to the servant or to Jesus. So he says, the Lord says or has called me from the womb. 
from the matrix or the inner part of my mother, he has made mention of my name. He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. That should ring a bell. Who that's referring to. In the shadow of his hand, he has hidden me and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver, he has hidden me. This is a very intimate description of what's going on between the father and the son. We're getting a little bit of look into that. He continues in verse 3. He says, And he said to me, You are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Isn't that a beautiful verse? We know Christ always glorified the Father. That's what he was here to do, was glorify the Father. Verse 4. He says, Then I said, I have labored in vain, I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain, yet surely my just reward is with the Lord and my work with my God. Remember this verse when we get a little bit further into our study tonight, when we look at the marks of ministry, because it aligns very closely with what he's saying here. Verse 5, he says, And now the Lord says, Who formed me from the womb to be his servant? to bring back Jacob to him, so that Israel is gathered to him. For I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. That's where Jesus' strength was. Indeed, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant. That's an interesting verse, but it'll make sense here in a minute. To raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel, I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles. So salvation was not just for Israel. This was kind of a a newer concept for the Jewish believer because they were the chosen people of God. But that wasn't the whole story or that's not all that the Lord had intended there. We know that. We would be considered one of the Gentiles. You will also give, or I will give you, I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. We've talked a lot about salvation. We'll look at that again a little bit more. But I want you to think about that, that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. That's what Jesus was. Now think about the three parts of salvation, the justification, sanctification, and glorification. It's more than just a ticket to get out of hell or from hell. Verse 7, he says, Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, their Holy One, to him whom man despises, to him whom the nation abhors. That's how they treated Jesus. We know that. To the servants of rulers, kings, shall see and arise. Princes shall worship because of the Lord, Yahweh, his covenant name, who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, and he has chosen you. Verse 8 is why we're here. This is what Paul just quoted. Thus says the Lord, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to my people, to the people to restore the earth, to cause them to inherit the desolate heritages, that you may say to the prisoners, go forth. To those who are in darkness, show yourselves. The very things that we saw Jesus do. They shall feed along the roads, and their pastures shall be on all desolate heights. They shall neither hunger nor thirst. The very thing that Jesus said. Neither heat nor sun shall strike them, for he who has mercy on them will lead them, even by the springs of water. He will guide them. I will make each of my mountains a road, and my highway shall be elevated. Surely these shall come forth from afar. Look, those from the north and the west, and these from the land of Sinem. Sing, O heavens, be joyful, O earth, and break forth or break out in singing, O mountains. For the Lord has comforted his people and will have mercy 
on his afflicted. So I wanted to take us back and I want to specifically look at that because that is the context in which this verse sits. So if you turn back to where we were in Corinthians, back to verse 2, for he says, in an acceptable time, I have heard you, and in the day of salvation, I have helped you. This, again, is a promise from God. God has heard and helped us by sending his son in the day of salvation. Now, when would be an important question to ask? Well, let's look at the rest of verse 2. He says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So when we're asking that question, well, when, Paul, when is this going to happen? Well, Paul is telling us that now, as he's quoting from the Old Testament, now is that time. Now is that day of salvation. Look at the emphasis on the now aspect. Now is the time. That's what he's telling us. Now, remember from what we looked at here in verse 1 where he was talking about the grace of God and not receiving that in vain? Well, that's what's in context here. Now is the time. We're in the age of grace. Maybe you've heard us refer to that as the dispensation or the period of time we're in now is the age of grace. We are under the Lord's grace. That's what was in context in verse 1. He said, don't take that in vain. But he says, not only is now the acceptable time, or the accepted time, but now is the day of salvation. Now, we saw that referred to when we were looking at Isaiah specifically, that the Lord was the salvation of God. But it's important to know here, or to remember, that there are the three parts of salvation that I referred to earlier. Now, there's justification. Now, in this case, think about who this is wrote to. Well, this letter, as we talked about this evening or at the beginning, is written to saints. So that wouldn't really apply here, right? Because it's assumed that they're already justified, that they've accepted the promise of God. So that's one part of salvation. But there's other parts of salvation as well. There's the sanctification aspect, the growth aspect, and the glorify or the glorification, the future aspect of it. So specifically here, Paul is saying now is the day of salvation. Not just about being saved, but it's now is the time for the growth. And that's what we're doing specifically here. That's what we're doing tonight. Is we're growing. We're looking, we're studying at it. So not only is he, when you think about that, when he says, now is the day of salvation, yes, now, church, is the day to grow in him, to become like him, like we read in Ephesians chapter 4. Now, in other words, now is the time for every aspect of salvation, not just the justification aspect. And that's where I think we largely miss this. In a lot of churches, that American gospel presentation really speaks to that. That we've, in a large part, a lot of churches have forgotten that second aspect of this. Well, he continues here in verse 3. He says, We give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. Now, similar to what Paul had previously said in the previous chapters, Paul's willing to do anything for the furtherance of his ministry or the Lord's ministry, the ministry of the gospel, that, you know, workers together with him, as he said in that first verse. Not only that, but he didn't want to be in an offense or a stumbling block in any way to them. He continues in verse 4, he says, But in all things... We commend ourselves as ministers of God. We'll hold up there for a second before we go further because there's a colon there. But he says, in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God. In other words, that's what his calling was. And it's the same calling for all believers. We are all ministers. I know we don't often think about it in that way because we're not necessarily the guy that's standing up in front. 
But we all are ministers. He told us that in the first verse tonight. He said, we then, as workers together with him, we are workers or ambassadors for Christ, spreading the ministry of Christ. So he says, rather, in all things, we commend ourselves as ministers of God. Now, that colon is kind of important because he's going to explain what that looks like. Remember back from what we looked at in Isaiah just a little bit ago? The ministry of Christ, it, was, it had some challenging times. You know, kings, the world, they didn't receive him specifically as we read. So what are the marks of ministry? Well, look at what he says next. And as we read on here, I want you to notice the use of two main prepositions that we're going to see. We're going to see two. We're going to see the word in, and we're going to see the word by. In and by. Now, in the Greek, they're all the same word, but we have a distinction here in our language, and I think it's important to look at that because I think it adds a little bit to what he's saying. So look for those two prepositions, the preposition of in and by, because it's going to create a little bit of a distinction between the two. So let's look at verse 4 again. He says, but in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God, colon, in much patience, in tribulation, in needs, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fastings. By purity, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere or unhypocritical love. We'll hold up there before we continue. So two distinct categories we see here. The first is in, meaning in what manner should we expect these things. And then the second preposition, by meaning how it is established. So look at what he says specifically here regarding the in ones. He says, well, in difficulties. Again, this is what the ministry of God looks like. In difficulties. Endurance or patience. Notice that one's listed first. That's probably one of the harder ones for us. That's certainly harder for me is to wait well, he doesn't stop there. He also says, in tribulations, in needs, in distresses, in stripes or beatings, in imprisonments, in tumults or like rioting aspect, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fastings. That's what the mark of the ministry looks like. And we've certainly seen that through church history. We read that in the book of Acts and the other guy. Um, even in the Gospels, we see, we see Jesus went through that as well. Well, how or in what manner? Well, he continues there. He says in verse 6, and this is where it transitions to the word by instead of ends. He says, well, by purity. Well, what's another word for purity? Truth. By knowledge. Knowledge is the application of truth. Oh, this next one, long-suffering. <laughs> That's an idea of time. By kindness. Who's doing the work? By the Holy Spirit, he says. By sincere love, <laughs> unhypocritical love. All these things we're reading about, maybe your mind went there. A lot of these are fruits of the Spirit. Because it's the Spirit-applied work here. The ministry of the Lord is Spirit-applied. It's by the Holy Spirit. So he continues, verse 7, he says, By the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right and on the left, by honor, by dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well-known, as dying and behold, we live, as chastened and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing all things. 
So here Paul continues with what that looks like and specifically what it looked like for him. A couple things to note there. The importance in verse 7 there of by the word of truth. Ministry must be based on the word of God. That has to be the foundation of it because in that foundation is Christ. That's what the scriptures testify to. Verses 8 through 10 as we just read. Well, Paul continues explaining what the marks of ministry look like, but by the way of distinction or by the way of a dichotomy, a comparison of opposites here, and we just read that, by honor and by dishonor. In other words, as you look at all these things here, it covers the whole spectrum. That's what Paul's saying, that his ministry in some things, well, by evil report, by good report, as deceivers, yet is true. That's what's going to happen. That's what we should see and expect to see as we minister. Verse 10 there is sorrowful yet rejoicing. There's sorrowful times when it comes to ministry. There certainly is rejoicing times. I think we've been there. As poor yet many rich, making many rich. Rich in Christ. As having nothing yet possessing all things. Think about the number of times that we've read and we've referenced recently about how Paul considered his life worth nothing, but yet possessing all things. In Christ, we can confidently say we possess all things in him. So these were the marks of Paul's ministry, who as we looked at in the beginning or opening verse tonight, are workers together with him. So the question to ask ourselves then, since what we just read are marks of Paul's ministry, and most importantly, the marks of Christ's ministry, Yahweh's servant, as we looked at in Isaiah, the question to ask then is, are they the marks of our ministry, since we too are Christ's? That's an important question to ask. That's what our ministry should be or should look like, that list that we've seen here by Paul. Which brings us to verse 11. He says, O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. I see Paul's compassion for the Corinthians here in this verse. Just the way he references them. O Corinthians, Now, I think it would be helpful, since we're looking at this and we're looking at how this applies to us specifically and how we too are workers together with him, maybe we need to change this for this evening and say, oh, church in Birmingham. Paul's spoken openly to them. That's what he says here. He's speaking openly to us as well from a completely transparent and loving way. Towards them. He's been open with them. He's practicing, in other words, what he preached to the church in Ephesus. In Ephesians chapter 4, 15, speaking the truth in love. That's what he's saying to them. And he's going to give them a little instruction here coming up next. But if you remember back where he said, speaking the truth in love to the church in Ephesus, specifically, Why did he say that to the church in Ephesus? Well, if your mind goes back to that verse, he continues and he says that they may grow up in all things into him who is the head, that being Christ. That's ultimately where that verse goes. So he was speaking some hard things. He's speaking the truth in love. He's being open with them that ultimately they would grow up exactly where Paul is going in a moment. Verse 12, he says, You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affection. In other words here, Paul is saying that it wasn't Paul that was hindering them. Rather, their own desires or affections were getting in the way of their spiritual progress. Now, we've got to ask ourselves, well, Paul, what affections are you referring to here? 
Well, he's going to explain that specifically in his plea to them in a minute. But as kind of a spoiler alert here, he's saying their affections were grounded in the love of the world. That's where they had their affections. Now, again, there's an application point for us here tonight. Are our own affections, like Paul stated was true of them, are they hindering our growth? The our being saved part of salvation, the sanctification aspect. So are our own affections hindering us? And we sung this evening, one of the songs that was sung, I Surrender All. All includes your affections, the things that you love too. I think if we're being honest with ourselves, we have a lot of affections that are grounded in the world. Well, that's where Paul's going to go here in a minute. Now, if there's any doubt as to whether maturity or growth, that second aspect of salvation we talked about, is in view here, well, look where Paul goes next in verse 13. Now, in return for the same, he throws this little parenthetical part in. He says, I speak as to children, you also be open. Well, I speak to you as children. Well, that's in light of their immaturity, as we saw that he referenced back in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 3, verse 1, where he says, I cannot speak to you as mature people. Well, Paul is saying here, I speak to you as children. And he asks them, he says, now in return for me being open to you, you also be open. Now, this part about you also being open. In other words, or maybe to simplify that a little bit, look at your true condition is what he's saying to them. Be honest with yourself. And in context, does your present condition match your position? As we looked at in the last chapter, he explained what our condition was. We're a new creation, we read earlier. So in other words, are you being open with yourself, Corinthian? Are you being open with yourself, church in Birmingham, about your true condition and where your affections lie? I think we should ask ourselves that same question. Does our present condition align with our heavenly position? Now, what should it look like? Well, that's a good question to ask. Now, here comes the block of instruction that Paul is about to deliver to them. Again, verse 13, he says, Now, in return for the same, I speak as to children, you also be open. Verse 14, he says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with Darkness. So what should it look like? Well, this is where a lot of people miss the big application point here in the next few verses, largely because they miss the context that Paul has been working to set up in these last couple of verses. Well, what is the context here? Well, the context is spiritual growth and what the marks of ministry look like. The very things we read and explain that we have positionally. Now, just to re, kind of remind ourselves, if you flip back to chapter 5 again, look at verses 16 and 17 again. Therefore, from now on, regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. He said, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that's the believer. He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's what he explained that we positionally are. We are a new creation as a believer. In the context, the immediate context, he's talking about spiritual growth. He's talking about what the marks of ministry look like for the spiritually mature individual. Now, this 
idea of not being unequally yoked together with unbelievers. It's not, and I've honestly heard this before, it's not about marrying a person of your same color. You know, for a long time, back during segregation, desegregation, and all that aspect, people were applying this verse to mean that you shouldn't marry a person of the opposite color. That is not what this means. For that matter, this really isn't about marriage at all. A lot of people use this passage for marriage. It applies here, because in context it applies, but that's not what the immediate context of this passage is all about. It's about, as a believer, a new creation being one with Christ. That's what he's saying. That's why he's telling them not to be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. So again, he says, Do not be unequally yoked to gather with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? In other words, church, believer, don't be friends with the world. Don't partner up with the world. Doesn't mean we can't be friendly to them. That doesn't mean we can't have co-workers or acquaintances like we talked about. There's a difference between that and being friends, that idea of being yoked together with them. And that's the very picture that Paul uses here. He says unequally yoked, that idea of an oxen being yoked together. If Sharon was here in the fellowship, she's probably laughing on here now because she knows what that meant. Because she was a farm girl. She tells us that a lot. But it only, when you're looking or you're talking about two oxen plowing together or working together, it only works when they are in harmony together. Now, I don't think any of us here work with oxen on a regular basis. But for a contemporary example, imagine trying to walk a massive St. Bernard dog or a Bernice Mountain dog, one of the bigger dogs, and you're trying to walk them together with a chihuahua. It doesn't work. One is twice, three, four times the size of the other one. They're different heights. They're going to pull at different rates. The little chihuahua is going to have to walk 100 times faster than the bigger dog because the bigger dog takes bigger steps. That's the picture that he's presenting here. You can't walk together with an unbeliever in that sense because you are a spiritual New creation, as Paul said previously. That's the idea Paul is trying to communicate. So again, he says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with the darkness? Now Paul, in case we didn't understand what Paul's saying, he's going to use or is using some examples here to explain that to us. The answer to Paul's questions here for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, the answers are resounding, well, it doesn't. What communion has light with darkness? Well, they're polar opposites from each other. Light and darkness, they're opposites. They're literally night and day from each other, right? He continues with the examples. And this is the main point example here in verse 15. He says, what accord has Christ with Belial? or with Satan, or with (coughs) idols, in other words. Well, he doesn't. They don't have a relation. They're not in agreement with each other. Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? Well, you don't. You're on two different standings. One's spiritually minded. The other is not. Verse 16, he continues... And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? Well, again, the answer to that is it doesn't. For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said. Back to verse 16 there, he says, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? It doesn't. If you're looking to idols, it's ultimately spiritual harlotry or spiritual adultery. You're cheating on God in a sense. There is no. Now here in verse 16, we get promise number two for this evening. I said that we're going to look at a couple promises of God. 
specifically, we saw one already, that he's given Christ as our helper. Well, here's the second promise we see this evening. He says, you, believer, are the temple of the living God. What an amazing promise that is. That's, we have, as believers, we are the temple or the house, the dwelling place for God. He doesn't dwell in a tabernacle anymore like he previously did or the temple like during David's time. <coughs> he continues here, and he quotes again. He says, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Promise number two, not only are we the dwelling place of God, but additionally, he says, and he backs it up with an Old Testament reference here, that God, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Paul here is quoting from Ezekiel, excuse me, 37, um, chapters, or verses 26 and 27, and kind of putting that together with what we read in Ezekiel chapter 36. It's not a direct quote from it, but that's what it says, that that is the promise of God, that under the, the new covenant, when Christ is here, that things are going to be different. I'm going to dwell directly in them, and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, we, when we looked at 1 Corinthians, we saw this there too. If you want to turn back over a couple of chapters to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you likely remember that this is the chapter specifically where Paul is giving a block of instruction to them regarding the brethren that um, was found in sexual immorality, well, just after that, he's given them a little bit more instruction. But he kind of references that again in verse 19 of chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians. He asks them a question, assuming they know the answer. He says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. So Paul had already given them this block of instruction, and now he's reminding them that, hey, you are the temple of the living God. So if you turn back over to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, now what are we to do as a result of that? Well, verse 17 explains to us, because it starts with a therefore. He says, therefore, again, Paul's quoting, he says, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Yahweh, his covenant name, Almighty. So what do we do as a result of what Paul just said? That we're not to be like the world. We are the temple of God who lives in us, quoting from the Old Testament. Saw that promise. Well, what are we to re do as a result? He says, again, therefore, he says, come out and be separate from among them. So now Paul is applying the word of truth from Isaiah 52, verse 11 as applied to their relationship to the world. Now, again, if you go back and look at that, it's not verbatim, but it's the Holy Spirit applying what the prophet Isaiah received from the Lord for their situation now. In other words, he's saying, come out and be separate from the world. That's what he's saying. And then later, he's applying a general concept from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 1 and 9, to illustrate the intimacy of the relationship between God and us. He says, I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters. That's a very intimate description of the relationship between us and the Father. Now, 
this idea of coming out and being separate from them. This is not a call to be Amish. The Amish tend, to, if you watched any of those documentaries on the Amish, this is one of their main passages that supports why they do what they do. Is because of this, what Paul's saying, come out and be separate from them. That would be a misapplication to take it as they are referring to it as. Rather, this is a call to be like Christ and not the world. In context, that's what Paul is talking about. Because the two are very opposed from each other. Now, <coughs> excuse me, Jesus says the same thing. and Maybe your mind's going there. When we looked at our study in John, from John chapter 17, if you want to pop over to the left here, specifically, if there's any doubt about our relationship to the world, <laughs> well, look at what Jesus says regarding that. In John chapter 17, picking it up in verse 16, we're going to kind of just jump into them. We'll pick it up in verse 15, actually. Let's back up to verse 14. I have given them your word. This is from John chapter 17, verse 14. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. Because they are not of the world. Think about what we talked about, what the marks of ministry look like. What we read about that the suffering servant would be, or what the coming servant would experience. Well, that's exactly what happened. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. That's something to look at specifically that's what the Lord prayed for us, not to be taken out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Speaking of God, verse 16, they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them. Now there's that word. In other words, set them apart, grow them up by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. So we're not to be of the world, but we are in the world. That's what he's saying here. In other words, that is our relationship to the world. We're in the world, but not of the world. We're not like the world. Well, if you turn back here to the right to 2 Corinthians, well, not only did we just get the block of instruction as Paul is quoting from the Old Testament saying, come out and be separate from them. In other words, don't be like the world. In verse 18, we get another promise from the Lord. This is, we'll call it promise number three for this evening. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So promise number three, he will be a father to us, and we shall be his sons and daughters. Scripture talks about this in many other places, about this relationship between us and the father, that we're his kids, in other words, that we have an inheritance as if kids and that relationship between parents and their kids. Now, now knowing this, and before we get into the what do you do with this part of the study for this evening, it's here to, it's important to ask ourselves another question as we're thinking about this. Are we presently unequally yoked to the world? It's something we need to ask ourselves. And we need to take a closer look at where our affections lie, as we saw in verse 12, as this will be a good litmus test as to whether or not we are unequally yoked with the world. Where do your affections lie? So as we make kind of a final application here, so what do we do with all this and what Paul told us this evening? Well, let's continue into the first verse of chapter 7, because I think it wraps up and bookends our study for tonight. He says, therefore, there again is that word, because of what we specifically looked at previously, he says, having these promises, beloved, 
Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And that's where we'll hold up this evening. But he says, therefore, having these promises. Well, it's the promises we specifically looked at this evening, but it also goes back to what we looked at last week in chapter 5, what we reviewed this evening, about the promises and the positional things that we have in Christ. But he says as a result of that, because we have these precious promises, let us cleanse ourselves. There's two parts here that Paul is going to challenge us with tonight as we leave or wrap up our study. He says, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So two parts Paul is challenging us with. An emptying and then a filling, in other words. The first one is something needs to be removed. He says, let us cleanse ourselves from all, that means every, no exceptions, filthiness. Look at how he described the flesh there. The filthiness of flesh. It's exactly what flesh is. Filthy, as God describes it. And he's saying, in other words, everything of our utterly corrupt flesh and spirit, as he says, both physically and spiritually, that's not of God, must go. That's his challenge. Well, it, that's not all of it, though. He continues, he said, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So now, not only are we to cleanse ourselves of that, well, we need to add something. Much like Paul also told the Corinthians in the Colossians, excuse me, in Colossians chapter 3, were to add, in other words, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So, in other words, to simplify that, we're to be like Christ. Remember what he challenged us in, with back in uh, chapter 5, verse uh, 17? Well, he said we're a new creation, just like he told the Colossians. He said you're to put on the new man. Because we're new creations. And this is a spirit applied and only comes by resting and abiding in his promises. A lot of times we try to do this ourselves and really all that is is sanctified flesh. We can't. It has to be done through the spirit. Very similar to what we looked at in chapter 3 about being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. How does that happen? Just as by the Spirit of the Lord. The same applies here. The only way that we can cleanse ourselves of the filthiness of the flesh and spirit and perfect holiness in the fear of God is by the power of the Holy Spirit. Our response is simply resting and abiding in His promises, His truth, as we looked at this evening. So two personal takeaways that I leave with you that the Lord really applied to me this week were those questions we asked ourselves. First and foremost, where do our affections lie? Do they lie in the Lord? As we sung this evening, I surrender all to him. Or do they lie in the world? So the first one is where do our affections lie? And then secondly, what are we yoked with? Are we yoked with the world? Are we yoked with Christ. So with that, we'll wrap up. We'll close here with prayer. Father God, we do thank you again for your word, Lord. We thank you for your truths. Lord, this evening we specifically, we saw three separate promises that you've given to us, Lord. We saw what we have positionally in you. Lord, my prayer for each of us this evening is that our condition would match our position that our affections would be set on you, on things above, Lord, not on things of the earth, not on things of the world. Lord, your word challenged us specifically this evening with the reminder, the plea for us not 
to have our our affections set in the world and not to be unequally yoked with the world. So, Father, my prayer is that we would cleanse ourselves of the filthiness, that we would seek you, Father God, resting and abiding in you and what you have already done for us. Father, I do thank you for this. I ask that you would continue to show us what you want us to know. Lord, it's so amazing how all these things have been just so interwoven. The references to the gospel, Father, the presentations we've seen recently, just so speak of you and the answer to our prayer that we've been praying to make us the church that you want us to be. So, Father, I do pray that very specific prayer and ask that you would continue to do that. That you would show us, Father, what things do need to be removed from our life. May may it be true of us to say that we do surrender all to you, Lord. To your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So I'll stop.